challenge, like every year, but I also sent a survey that was different and only to the students who did not participate to the programming challenge. And I was asking questions such as, under different conditions, would you have participated to the challenge? Or is there something we can do to make me to maybe make you enjoy it? Or is it just because it, it's a clear no? And we still have roughly half of the students who did not participate, who had reasons with which they could have participated. Some is about having more time. So, But some also said, I didn't know where to start. It felt a bit impressive. We had seen a few techniques, but how do you translate that from, okay, now you're facing a code and you have to parallelize it and I don't know what to do. And we thought maybe, okay, we, can, we could try to have this kind of step-by-step -step session where for students who are not participating to the programming challenge, we can maybe help uh, demystify the whole process of, okay, where do you go from now? You've learned some OpenMP, you've learned some MPI, what do you do with it? So if you are participating to the programming challenge, you're welcome to stay, but you're extremely unlikely to see something you have not done already. Okay, you will probably be maybe disappointed by how much we're going to cover because the point is not to cover much, it's just to cover what other students m would have needed to get their starting point, okay? Again, it's the first time ever we do this session. I don't even know myself what would be the right pace, what would be the depth or coverage of what I'm about to cover, but I want it to be very interactive. Why? Because the idea is to see where you are and where you are stuck to see maybe what could be another approach and where we could go from there. So if we have a look at, so I will use the C version, but it, it's really copy paste with a Fortran. So, so you have a code like this, okay. Um, sorry, make it bigger, yes I can. Okay, maybe not that big. I'm too generous, okay, up, let's do it. Is it better? Yes? Okay. So you're facing this code, and what what is your first reflex when you look at this? <coughs> Especially the ones who are freezing when looking at it. Again, it's not going to be me talking for an hour. That, that wouldn't be very useful. The idea is seeing where you, how you would approach it, and see how other people approach it, and see what happens next. That's exactly what I was expecting. I told you that. I told you what the first two steps were going to be, right? Yes? I, did, I, I hope that was going to be the answer that I was going to get. Going straight into optimizations. Like, okay, can I work the, this loop here is, and that's, I'm sneaky because I put this loop right in the middle of the screen because that's the loop that everybody wants to remove. Why? Because I designed it this way. So the idea was to incite you to think about optimizing the code where Wait, we don't even know where the runtime goes right now. We don't even know if that's a problem at all. If that takes not even one, one tenth of a percent of the runtime, it's not even worth your brain time thinking about this. First, we need to know if, if the time goes somewhere that we suspect or if it goes somewhere else we didn't see coming. But you may say, yeah, but I have this idea of optimizations and when I look at the code for the first time, I get many ideas and I'm going to lose them. You're not going to lose them. You just go on, uh, go on GitHub, right? And you just put that in issues. And you just write your super new idea there, okay? We do that in the MPI forum, for example. So MPI is using, is using this approach, where you just type what you th think your problem is and what you think a solution looks like. And that's it. Your problem here uh, can be, oh, okay, so this for loop, uh, useless for loop, Okay, and then you put that as in a factorize it or something else, okay? You put your little label, like uh, I don't know, enhancement or idea for an optimization, and you move on, and you do that with all the ideas you have. So they're saved, and now you can move on with something else. If we are, so what other approaches were there, by the way? So going for optimizations right away, that's a very classic way to do it. I'm not saying bad, by the way. It's just one way to do it. Any other approaches? Diving right into the code, profiling. Anyone else did something else? Or would do something else? No? Okay. 
Put it into chat GPT and see what it says. <laughs> I didn't, well, <laughs> that would be, well, no, because actually this is something we're we are more and more faced um, in education. ChatGPT is a bit is a big uh, ally enemy or something in between. Um, the thing is with HPC, with with AI in general, I won't go into an AI talk right now. I'll just do ten seconds on this. Uh, it will tell you whatever it's talking about with the same amount of confidence, even when it's making a mistake. And you say, oh, but, 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 you're making a mistake here. You say, oh yeah, sorry. It, boom, and you write something again with the same level of confidence. And sometimes it in search another mistake somewhere else that wasn't there in the first time. Um, yeah, with ChatGPT and AI, when it comes to this, they really struggle. Why? Because that's tricky to get right. And if it doesn't get right and you don't know where it's wrong, you're now in the situation you don't want to be in. Anyway, so how can I profile something? I have multiple approaches. Which one would you use? I guess we'll have two, two schools of thoughts right here. Let's see. I would like to know where my time goes there. How can I do it? <laughs> That's the first school of thoughts. <laughs> Good old print F, that definitely works. Uh, I'm I'm it's not a good thing to say it, but I'm clearly in, in that in that school of thoughts. Uh, the other one is to use the actual providing tools, right? But I, I assume that if students are maybe not comfortable yet starting with parallelization, it's maybe because they, they are not comfortable with these tools also. So maybe you're more comfortable with using good old print statements, which can be very fine. Using uh, print statements at very specific locations for a very specific session of your code can help you. Of course, they will not provide you the same accuracy as actual proper profiling. But if you're looking roughly where your time goes and a section of your time of your code takes 90% of the runtime, that should be visible clearly, whether it's actual profiling or good old print statements. Okay? So now, okay, you've done your profiling, you have an idea of where your code goes. Now it comes down to uh, whew, the actual code. So now you've seen that basically these four loops are, are where, where the time goes. Now it comes down to, okay, you have to stop to optimize something, but uh, what do you do? Again, the idea is really going to, is going to try for you to say what would be your first steps. I have an idea on how I would optimize it, I must say. I designed it, so I even have more ideas about how I can optimize it. But it's more the idea of, okay, if you're stuck, where is it that you're stuck? So that we can have other people maybe help you or we can exchange on this. Who is wondering we don't even know where to start. There are like many for loops and am I supposed to paralyze it? Am I supposed to rethink about the algorithm itself? Am I supposed to start injecting assembly code? Am I supposed to... Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Reversing loops? Uh, uh, can you can you please give me the line number to make sure that we're talking about the same? This one. Yes. I uh, know. No. Well. It, you may say something wrong, but nobody dies anyway. That's fine. Uh, yes, you're right. So that is, that's already very low level. So it's in C, the element that next to this one in memory is this one, okay? In Fortran, it's this one. Of course, they had to be opposite. Wouldn't be fun otherwise. So, and when you're switching from C and Fortran, oof. Anyway. 
So yeah, that's that's one thing you can think of. Yes, trying to optimize the algorithm. You have two ways to do something, and depending on the on the on the situation, there's no clear winner. You can try to parallelize first, and then try to think about the algorithm itself, or you can think about the algorithm itself and then parallelize for second. Why do I say there's no winner? That there's no clear winner. Because you may you may say, well, why would I parallelize something that is not efficient to begin with? That's a very sound argument, which works in many cases. There are scenarios where optimizing the algorithm is going to deprive you of parallelization potential. So it means that by having done something smarter, algorithmically speaking, you're effectively now are hindering your potential to parallelize it which is not really a problem when you don't have much parallelization to begin with. When you have only two, five, ten cores, maybe yes. And maybe for this programming challenge, maybe as well. But when you start to consider large scale with, with thousands and thousands of nodes, now actually you may do something that at first seems a bit silly, but you know that the scalability is much better. And after maybe 200 nodes, ah, now my silly approach that I've been able to parallelize to 95% efficiency is giving me a much better performance from now on than the super smart algorithmic optimizations which scale way less, which are now flattening f for good. So that's one thing. Did you have another idea, Michele? No, just, maybe it was stupid comment, but no stupid comments. That's another way to approach it, yes. It's, uh, there are multiple levels of optimizations. There, there are the low levels. It's typically the one that are more natural to computer scientists is we want to dive right in. So we go for the indexes, for the loop, or, uh, loop ordering, or for the cache usage. That's already super technical. There are the much higher level approaches where the idea is, let's try to understand how the algorithm works and see if we can refactor the algorithm. Here in this programming challenge, the idea, and it's you don't need to go very far to, to see it. It's right in the brief on the before even the code, which is your challenge is to optimize it using OpenMP and MPI, i.e. the idea is for you to practice what you've learned. There's no point in, in me trying to assess you on your ability to inject manual SSE uh, instructions or something, or do manual SIMD. Or, yes, you can do it in real life. Yes, you should, can do it. But here the idea is, okay, you've learned how to parallelize a code have fun doing it here. That's why I've been spending my week telling students, I'm sorry you cannot do this. I'm sorry you cannot do that. It's very smart, but it's too advanced from what I'm looking for here. So we understanding what the code does is a good one because then you would be able to do some optimizations that you cannot do otherwise, i.e. you can optimize a bubble sort to hell. You can parallelize it crazy. But if you can re-engineer the bubble sort into a quick sort, Ah, maybe your starting point is not the same. Again, maybe it's, yeah, it comes down to also the parallelization potential that has maybe going to, is going maybe to nuance your appreciation, but that's something you can't do without understanding. Linking to careers and, and that. We, we have a few students who are saying, oh, uh, but what happens? Because I, I know a few fields, but I'm not an expert in one of them. And I said, well, you have two profiles. You have the, the, the expert and you have the generalist. The generalist is the, is the person able to interface, interface many experts. I know nothing in physics, I know nothing in computer chemistry, and all your lovely research fields that I, when you presented research posters, I was <laughs> lost all the time. My thing is computer science. You want to talk about hardcore database website? Yeah, go for it. Uh, quantum, uh, astrophysics, uh, no, no, no. PD is my best and that's it. So I need someone to be able to interface you with me, and that's a generalist. Okay, so multiple parts. So the page rank, as I said, it's a graph processing that's basically going to evaluate the popularity or of certain points in the graph by seeing how many uh, links you have to that in an iterative approach. Okay, so you spread your popularity around it. So you have multiple phases. The first one is you're going to initialize it. There's no real way to uh, to bypass this. Where are we going to initialize it to? One nth. So every point in the graph starts with the same flat popularity. And then we're going to see, based on the connection, the connectivity, where these are going to go. The data 
we're going to rely on is produced by a graph generator. There are two, we'll see that later. Sneaky graph and something, if, if you've looked at the code, it's sneaky, there's a reason. But we'll see that after that. Then we have a few variables and so on. Well, that's just for timing. So all that for timing you can ignore. New page rank, because when we're going to update the value, we'll store that into a new array. And at the end of the iteration, we'll just swap the arrays. OK, so we have the current array popularity, the next array of your popularity and how, how connected your page is. And at the end of the iteration, we just swap and we start again. It's something you do in many fields, I guess. The dumping value, that's, you can see it as uh, the, the importance of, uh, it's going to modularize the importance you, you put on the connectivity compared to some default popularity sharing should we say? It's just to tune the algorithm. Okay, well now we get into the actual part of, of it. This is not part of the algorithm itself. It's me having designed it so that we stop after a certain amount of time. Why? Because in the past you would all start with the same algorithm that would take maybe two minutes and the issue was two minutes at the start you would take the full note for two minutes and other students would have to wait a lot and the idea was, okay, make it as fast as you could. When I did the challenge, that's how it was done, for example. So I redesigned it so that everybody uses it for 10 seconds, and now I swapped it, so the idea is you do as many iterations as possible with 10 seconds, okay? So initialization here, where we, we think, if we want to start with parallelization, we're going, you've seen OpenMP, you've seen MPI, okay? MPI requires you to rewrite the program entirely, because now you need to think in terms of multiple MPI processes, okay? OpenMP doesn't require you to do that. You can do incremental parallelization. So the OpenMP bit can be easier to insert at first to spot where you have areas that you can parallelize easily. So how do you parallelize that if you were to start with this? Even if, yeah, I could replace it with a mem clean something, yes, you could. But the idea is, yeah, I see some people saying, yeah, that's what I was doing. Yeah, I know, it's, <laughs> it's a smart way to do it. But this programming challenge is not so much about smart ways. It's about for you to practice parallelization again and again. Well, do you think this can be parallelized to begin with? Yes, yes. Okay, that's parallel. So I can have fun with this later, cool. Now, okay, now we start to have three nested loops with if statements and everything. Okay, that's not the same thing now. It's, it seems a bit less trivial, right? Uh, what does this one do? For every vertex, uh, I'm going to check uh, for every neighbor after that, if they ha how many neighbors they have. The out degree is the number of neighbors outwards that a vertex has. So what this loop does is that it counts how many degrees, how many uh, neighbors you have, so what's your out degree? So all this is how many, how many neighbors you have. And then it's based on this, you're going to calculate your new page rank, okay? By saying, I'm going to split my popularity evenly across my neighbors. This is how it propagates, okay? So if you have only two neighbors, whatever impact you have, you give it to your two neighbors, okay? If you have 50 neighbors, you give every of these 50 neighbors a 50th of your popularity. That's how it spreads. That's how Google does it behind the scenes. It has become more complex now, but that's how it used to work primarily. Is there anything that can be parallelized here? Because now we see for loops and nested for loops and things like this. So I see already frowned eyebrows, which is good. What would you do there? Good. Because so now, let's see how that works. It's great that this is happening because more or less I can, I think, unambiguously asserting that I have already killed roughly half of the audience in 15 minutes. So clearly, this approach doesn't work. So now let's see if we can find something that works better. So how would you like this session to run? Again, it's the first time. So the approach I had in mind, not working. That's absolutely fine. Let's try another one. So how would you like this session to run? Is it something where I would show you, for example, how I would do it? 
I was afraid that would be making you too passive in a, of an audience. Or is it what type of optimizations could be used or what type of technologies, or approaches? Now it's your turn to talk. Go ahead. Promise I won't be hurt. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why it was the, the, the little mention was for non participants. Even this was the, the name of the session is Programming Challenge Walkthrough for Non Participants. That's the name of the session. <laughs> Which is why the starting point is I might face students who were just, again, I'm, I was thinking of the students who maybe were here last, last year on the survey saying, I wish I had done it, but I, I didn't know where to start. And this I didn't know where to start was, OK, let's see if I could get you to see where you thought you would have started. But yeah, that's why I said at the start, if you're here to check if certain optimizations are possible, like, OK, I tried to inline some uh, AVX 512 thing. Can I use that? <laughs> that's beyond the scope of this session. So let's say it this way. Who here is actually taking part in the programming challenge to see if we have any non-participant to begin with? That's not, wait, wait, wait. Say the question again. Who, who, is, who is participating? So I can, who is participating to the programming challenge? OK, so we do have at least a good half of the audience not participating. Great. Yeah, of course. of course it's still running. But the thing is, what we're going to cover here is unlikely to make a difference to, yeah, yeah, because here we're going to cover the basics. It's really how you start. Because then once you have started, it's like a bike. The first few steps, the first few pedal hits are the hardest ones. Then when you have some momentum, just keep going. When, you have, when we've seen how to, uh, how to trigger the first two, three optimizations, then you just, every time you find a new one, you just reproduce the process. But it's that first one is hard to get out. Algorithm optimization, do I use CUDA? Or do I use, do I use OpenMP right away or MPI? Do I combine both? Do I create branches? Do I, it's this starting point at first that can be a bit tricky. Yes? Uh, the remove and triple loop. Remo <laughs> you love loops. Yes. Remove repo which parts are with the loops? Uh, OK, so how would you break it down if we are to try to break this one down? Ah, pre computing things. OK, I like uh, it. And then, and then that way you there, there, there was something that we were discussing with certain students in the summer school uh, about their research and how I would optimize their code if I, if I were the one doing it. And I said, before I'm going to jump into any low-level stuff, we're going to go very high-level first, which is, what result do you need when? And when I calculate this result and the following result, is there any intermediate step I can rely on? Can I create some type of intermediate result that I can just build on again and again and again, so I can save entire computations at once. That's no exception. You're, you're proposing to then start save computations, splitting the loop, and try to get contiguous accesses and, and split be, be uh, traded. And then if we were to go further than this, because um, I, I may not have a mathematic mind, <laughs> but it's then you have some data that maybe you're recomputing all the time and give you the same result anyway. Because at, in this case, we count the number of neighbors we have. But the graph doesn't change. It's the same graph. You keep asking to get your number of neighbors. And you keep recalculating this. But you always get the same answer. Regardless of how, optimized, or how much you optimize that calculation, you just need it once to begin with. So your gains into optimizing the time it takes to do this computation will be outweighed by the fact that you can save all yes okay will be outweighed by the fact that you can just save doing this computation in the first place and doing it only once that's one of the of the classic algorithmic optimizations i'm expecting here which is when you see that you keep recalculating the same thing again and again stop doing that and that doesn't require parallelization. That just requires understanding the algorithm itself. OK? Now, if you are to parallelize anything with a reduction, in OpenMP, if you were in the session, you've seen how to do it. If you're not in the session, if you know OpenMP, you probably know how to do it. So how would you do that, by the way? If I were to parallelize that whole thing here, 
so that somehow I can calculate it once and just refer to it again and again. Is, is there anyone lost by me saying that now we can calculate it once and be done with it? Is there anyone who does not understand why? Okay. So we have this triple loop. One of them is out of the equation now. I'm just left with these two and the F, all this to get a reduction here. How do I parallelize that? If this somehow becomes a, uh, I don't know, my number of neighbor or something. How do I parallelize this loop? These loops. Who was in the OpenMP session? Only the ones in the challenge. <laughs> okay, well, the other ones you are welcome to come in the OpenMP session. That's, that's interesting. The correlation is really interesting. Extremely the fact that you may not have raised your hand, okay? But otherwise, the correlation is amazing. All the ones in the challenge are the ones from the OpenMP session. It's like, hmm. Okay, well. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll start to write that. So in OpenMP to parallelize something, you can put your new page rank here. Up. So, oh, is there anyone who does not know OpenMP? Okay, so it's safe to proceed with OpenMP, fine. So I can even skip that part then of writing the pragmas, you know how to parallelize it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was going to, to, to skip it there, but yeah, you can four, you can even collapse them if you know how to collapse, but that for the, for the challenge is, is, we've not seen collapsing, so I prefer not to allow collapse because I don't want to give an unfair advantage to students who know additional pragmas and constructs and everything. So, but yeah, we can even collapse, you can start to work with a SIMD if you know single instruction multiple data. Yes. Collapse is, okay, that's a very good question. I have two, um, two loops here. So it means I have two iteration sets. One iteration set for the first loop, one iteration set for the second loop. Collapse is going to merge these two iteration sets into a massive one. So you end up, virtually speaking, with one massive loop. And you may wonder, why do we even want to... So did you understand my, my definition, by the way? That we merge two in one with massive uh, uh, iteration set. You may wonder, why do we even want to collapse loops to begin with? What kind of benefits could that give us? The reason is, sometimes, and typically most of the time, we have iterations that are not identical. The amount of work to be done is not identical. So we have then load balancing issues. And when you parallelize just the outer loop, you can apply load balancing techniques on the outer loop. But anything that happens inside it is trickier. When you merge both loops, then you have only a single long loop to do so. Then every iteration contains the actual final work, not another loop of something behind the scenes. That kind of makes sense. Yes? Co collapse took me a while to really get. Yes? That's because sometimes you cannot just collapse things right away. When you have two very nice four loops, very clean like this, right after the other, yeah, collapsing is, is more essay. It's a textbook case for collapsing. But at times, you start to have maybe some dependencies that are preventing the collapse from going so smoothly, should I say. Okay, so you all know how to parallelize this, fine. So that's the first phase, really of optimizations, just take the codes, you see which ones are easily parallelizable, embarrassingly parallelizable, take your pick. And once you've covered all of them, so you have a little reduction here, and again, everything is, is independent here, you see that all loops are very nice. All the iterations are independent, very simple reductions. Again, that's a simple code. Keep in mind something. Keep in mind something, by the way. For those of you who are doing the challenge, or even if you have not done the challenge and you're like, but that thing is so simple. Remember, on Monday, you have a 12-hour day from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Tuesday, you have a 12-hour day, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. 
it's only from Wednesday at 4 p.m. that you start to have some time for yourself in the late afternoon. And let's assume that the only thing you think of is the programming challenge. Even if you keep asking, adding all that time, you don't have much time at the end. Especially if now you're discovering OpenMP and MPI, I have to design something that basically could take you three to four hours to complete to reach a reasonable, um, satisfactory state for you to be happy about what you've done. So I cannot find, I can come up with something noticeably harder, trust me. Uh, I've done my, my entire PhD on graph processing. I can find something maybe that could challenge all of you. But it's not the point here. The point here is to give something to everybody to practice. So sorry if you were not challenged uh, because you are just too, too knowledgeable about this topic to begin with. Maybe next year we're going to do a second version of the programming challenge where there will be this version for the students who are discovering and then a slightly, no, drastically less friendly version for the more hardcore who want just to get something noticeably more challenging, you'll, you'll be served. But then it means you'll have access to everything you want. So every programming language, every compiler, compilation flag, algorithmic optimizations, it's up to you. You want to write everything in CUDA and Rust, have fun. But it means then you're competing with anyone who's in that same mindset. And this one, I will keep this one more gentle, friendly, step-by-step -step approach for those who are discovering. So, you keep dropping your pragmas, you all know OpenMP. So you keep paralyzing the code independently, okay? Now you start to have two issues. Number one is your code is broken down. There's no overall optimization. You've analyzed your code bits by bits that you've, you've optimized independently, okay? Now you start to have optimizations of merging and merging effects when you can reuse maybe some results you have somewhere with some other result. Maybe you're accessing some array element here that you would need in another loop. So which one could it be? Page rank, uh, yeah, for example, this. I'm not sure putting that in two loops is very useful because do you know cache? Are you, are you comfortable with cache? Yes, roughly, yes. When we do this, we're putting the data in cache. So why not reusing it right away? Why am I going to do it for every single element and then going to reload them? I've just written them. I've just written them here so I can reuse it right away here. So these are small things that maybe are not visible instantly if you start by paralyzing your code. But then you need to think about starting to merge your different sections. You will not be able to go very far if you keep everything in isolation. Okay. And then you get going. Okay, so let's say you've started to, to uh, parallelize your code. So you're happy, your code can now start to scale, or start to run in parallel. What do you do then? What happens? So you have your code, you've dropped a few pragmas, you're happy, it runs. What do you do with it? When you want to run it, what do you have in mind? Do you run it on, on the max number of threads, on one thread, on, on many number of threads? What do you do from there? Yes. So you run with multiple number of threads? You, you run with multiple number of threads from one to something, or you, you run directly with 48 or whatever number we have? Yes, that's a, good, that's a good approach. One of the trap is to go straight with a max number of thread, and the reasoning behind the scenes can be heard. It's, well, I have 256 threads. I'll just use 256 to begin with, and I'm good to go. I'll just use the max number of threads. Yes, but I have a sneaky graph. The way it works is the sneaky graph is actually nicer. It will take less time than the big graph to, pro to process, but it changes the scalability. So students who go straight into 256 will see that going, by going to the sneaky one, their, their program is actually faster. But the scalability now is totally changed and they, and they haven't seen that. Because this, the first one, is a fully connected graph, okay? So it means every vertex is connected to every other vertex. The second one is kind of a triangular graph, if you want, where every vertex is connected to its previous vertices. So when you get to the first one, you have very few neighbors, the very last ones are connected to more or less the whole graph. So it means the time it takes to calculate everything with your neighbor goes up. And that means that if you don't take care of these load balancing issues behind the scenes, your scalability is not going to be nice. 
and you won't see that if you just print, if you just go with the last point in the whole curve, okay? So you need to check how your curve goes, how your scalability goes to see if there's a problem now. If your code was scaling really well with the first graph, you switch to the sneaky graph or whatever other input data, data input you have, and all of a sudden, your scalability is totally different. You know there's something that changed somewhere. Now you need to investigate again. Load balancing, maybe cache locality, temporality, something stopped working somewhere. Okay, so in your codes, do not assume that because your code scaled well on a data set, whatever data set you're working with, you will have the very same benefits with any other data sets. Okay, that is simply not true, depending on the algorithm. So that was another, um, another trick um, about that you could find in the, uh, in the programming challenge there. Is there anything else that someone would think of right now about whether other steps? Okay, so we've parallelized the code with sections independently. Then we started to see if we could merge some optimizations together. Then we, we would start to run the experiments, see the scalability. Then when we find the scalability, where, where can we go from there? So, so far you're using all the CPUs on one node. You have two, two possibilities from there. Which one are they? Yes. Well, one is to use MPI, right? Exactly. One is to use the second node. You have two nodes available, which means you have all the CPUs of two nodes available to you. That's the first approach. Second approach? Exactly. You have the GPUs as well. Eight GPUs. Uh, spoiler alert, that's overkill for, <laughs> for this programming challenge. It's just, the GPUs are way too powerful for this programming challenge. Uh, if, I, if I want to keep, if I want to design something that's going to keep the G, eight GPUs like that busy full time for 10 seconds, I'm going to need something substantially more more demanding than a simple page rank over 10, over, over a thousand vertices, right? But again, I cannot, I cannot give you a programming challenge that takes five hours to complete before you optimize. It's, I need something that, that is somehow short from the start. That's tricky, to, that's tricky to design. So yeah, multiple nodes or GPUs, even both. In your, pro, in your, in your actual research, the idea is use everything you have at your disposal. It's not because you're paralyzing for CPUs that you have to stay stuck on CPUs, right? If you have GPUs, try also to use GPUs, but it's not because you're using GPUs that you have to give up on your CPUs. In the OpenMP session, we've seen how to use asynchronous execution on GPUs, which means use your, your GPUs, but also make these CPUs work. On bridges, how many CPUs do you have? Is it 256 or how many do we have on these bridges nodes? I think it was something like 256. Uh, that's a high number, I think. Any bridges expert in the room? Wouldn't take long to find out anyway, but. Anyway, I remember, I remember it's a high number. So try to use everything you can. Ideally, you want then to design your code so that the CPU friendly parts of your code go on the CPU, the GPU friendly part go on the GPU. That may sound silly and you may think, well, thank you, Captain Obvious. In actual real world, case and codes, it's less trivial to spot that you, one may think at first, okay? Issue, if we start to go with GPUs, is the time it takes to spend to send the data there compared to the amount of work you have to give the GPU. That, you've tried already? It, uh, I've tried something similar once and it didn't make sense. It took too much time to... Uh... Yes, before you start optimizing to hell that thing, what you need to check, and that's another, uh, another approach in this, uh, in this session, is before you, you dive into using a device for something because the device has a lot of popularity and your lab loves it and you have a lot of funding for it, check if it's even worth it. GPUs, the check is very simple. If it takes you more time to pass the data to the GPU than the amount of time you save on the computation from that GPU, don't use the GPU. You're going to spend a lot of time rewriting something for a device that's not that's not working well for it. You can use with you can you can come up with very fancy streaming techniques overlapping the both engines. Yes. Is, are you really going to see something at the end of the day? That's what you're looking for. Optimizing really 
really requires you to keep jumping between these levels of, okay, I have this piece of code, can I optimize that piece of code? And the more high level approaches of, should I even use GPUs to begin with? Okay, so keep, keep moving between these, uh, these layers. MPI, how do, how do you move a code to MPI? For those of you who, who know MPI, oh, oh, is there anyone who does not know MPI in the room? Ah, okay, I, I would say you all know MPI, MPI, you all know MPI, wow. Okay, okay. Yeah, MPI, you need MPI when you have, when you want to use multiple machines, okay? Open MP, regardless how you use it, you will never be able to scale beyond one node. Period. That's part of being an OpenMP. You have a single instance of your program. It has to run on one machine and one machine only. It's only one instance of your program. With MPI, you can run multiple instances of your program. So then you can put different instances on different nodes and make them connect somehow and communicate with messages. MPI then brings you another, another um, level of difficulty here. Has anyone ever tried to do load balancing on MPI? <laughs> oh, oh, the faces were amazing. I said, has anyone tried to do load balancing on MPI and I've, and I've seen a few doing, ooh. <laughs> that means yes. Okay. Yeah, it's really hard. In OpenMP, you have uh, schedule, static, dynamic, the chunk size, guided, auto, and so on. In MPI, forget it. In MPI, you have two MPI processes. They can just send messages. So when you're going to split the data between the two, you'd better make a smart decision because it's going to be tricky to change that load at runtime. If you ever tried it, you know what I mean. Yes, <laughs> I see some faces that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't forget it. <laughs> so to the ones who did not participate to the programming challenge, what is there that you still feel confused about? So we've covered the first couple of steps of you can either start by optimizing the algorithm itself, you can parallelize the code. If you want to parallelize the code, you can start to analyze the sections independently, see how much parallelism you have in each, dropping a few comments or a few pragmas to start leveraging that, that parallelism, then starting to merge those independently parallel parts and try to have as much parallelism as possible throughout your program to use your node as, as best as you can. Because as we often say, there's no point in using multiple nodes if you still don't know how to use one correctly. So before you use 2,000 nodes and write a uh, big number somewhere, make sure that you know how to use one correctly. Because anything you, anything you will do better on one node when you will scale, will become thousand times better on thousand times nodes, okay? If I simplify a bit. So now you used all your cores, you can go to either CPU or you can go to multiple nodes, and then you start to build up from there. The thing is, you're going to have to track your optimizations because especially now the ones doing the programming challenge, if your first approach was to go straight into optimizations, after half an hour, you've already modified the code 50 times. Now you have no idea which optimization has become detrimental. You're just combining and combining and combining. And sometimes an optimization that you've put has negated the gain that you were having from somewhere else. And maybe an optimization now has become counterproductive. Use branches to track your optimizations. Um, I forgot the name, was it Eric that was talking about this? for Gromax, yeah. he was explaining. So I like to think he knows what he's talking about, right? He was explaining that you need all these branches for new features, for optimizations, to keep everything independent and clean, to disable, enable something you want on demand. That is the perfect case for this. When you start to have open MP code, MPI code, then you start to try to merge them and everything you really have to make sure you can keep track of what you're doing. But that you will only see really when you do it yourself. If you've never tried it, my words probably seem very boring. When you will face yourself for the first time in your life with that very compound situation where you have no idea now to, how to untangle OpenMP and MPI because you've wrote, you wrote it with everything at the same time, you will understand that going step by step is going to make your life easier. Anyone who found themselves in this situation of having done too much at once and now being unable to withdraw from it because too many optimizations, frameworks mingled at the same time? 
I'm the only one who has done this? Really, really? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, you're much better than I am because I definitely did this a couple of times. <laughs> okay, that's already the last 10 minutes of this, um, of this session. Because I think it's 4.30, right? Yes. So, as, I'm, as I like to think I'm not entirely deluded, I'm clearly going to need your feedback to make this session totally different next year. As I said, remember at the start you were saying, uh, someone asked in the audience, oh, but ha ha is there anything that changes from a year to the next? Or basically, and the student didn't say this, that's just me adding from now on. Or basically, do you just come to say hi to each other and repeat what you say every year? No, we do change things. And I, I, I even said at that time, we also try things that sometimes work and we keep doing them, and sometimes they don't work and we change. This session is probably an example of the later. <laughs> but the idea is, now I need to understand something, which is, is it the idea itself, the idea of this session that maybe is not very uh, exciting, or is it my execution of this idea? which means this idea still has potential. It's just the way I tried to use it that clearly is not good. I'm fine with that. Okay, as a teacher, I had to be fine with it very early. It's my job to accept that. So if it's me who really have, has somehow missed something in this session, please tell me no offense taken, no nothing at all. If anything, it will allow me to make this session much more interesting next year, even if it means coming from an entirely new angle. Maybe it will be designed for both non-participant and participant, or remove the session if really you think it's the idea itself that actually is not worth it. It would be better to have a session for, I don't know, optimization eligibility where students can ask which optimization was allowed and which was not allowed or something. So we'll see how it goes. For the time being, yeah, I think try to send me by email. Um, unless you want an anonymous way to do it, I can, I can create a form if you want, anonymous feedback, but typically we need anonymous when you, when you feel uncomfortable from doing it because saying, so, saying something negative to someone, it's not good because they're gonna sack you. I'm not gonna sack you. <laughs> we'll, we will probably not meet, and I'm very sad to, to see this, but we'll probably not meet for a long time if we ever meet again. I promise I will have a, no, no influence on your career or anything. But I, I do need, however, because it's not the first time I do something that does not work. It's typically part of trying, okay? You have to accept you will fail when you try things. Sometimes I try and it works, sometimes I try and it doesn't, it doesn't, or it works less. So I need to understand now how I can try better next year, okay? So please, help me with that. For the time being, I guess, I can slowly bring this uh, session to a, con to a conclusion, even five minutes extra for you. Remember at five downstairs, will have the buses, and I believe at 5.15, the buses are gone, right? And remember, our Japanese hosts are very punctual. Do not come at 5.16. Five, you're in the bus. 5.15, we're all gone for a nice dinner. For the time being, regardless of how useful that session was, please help me making it more useful next year. Thank you for your time, nonetheless. Thank you.